yeah, just want to um, before Dr. Valiente, so before um, listening to your pre presentation, so we have uh, we have recruited some new team members that we would like to briefly introduce them, maybe in a couple of minutes, if you don't mind. Uh, so, Petra, if you can uh, bring up the, the slide, so we can. Uh, for sure, the new members. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Dr. Valiente, would it be okay if you can um, just uh, pause okay. screen sharing for a second? Yeah, no worries. Uh, let's see, I have it here. Okay, all right. So we have that here. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, uh, we just wanted to take uh, just a few minutes, a um, couple minutes or so to introduce uh, some of the new members of our team. Uh, we're gonna start with one of the most important uh, people that uh, one of the most important members of our team who's actually been uh, on uh, from the beginning, but we never had a proper um, uh, time for him to introduce himself and kind of talk about his role. And uh, Benjamin, uh, why don't you take the stage and uh, give us a quick introduction? Awesome, well, thank you so much. Uh, for, first for having me in the team, I'm uh, very excited and delighted to be a uh, part of CANSA and being part of the uh, initiative. Uh, yeah, so I'm Benjamin. I will be starting uh, my medical uh, school uh, journey in a and two months or so uh, in the other side of the world in Australia. I'll be heading to uh, Deakin University. And I recently finished my Bachelor of Science in Health Science and um, with a minor in History uh, from uh, Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. And uh, I'm super passionate about uh, knowledge translation, obviously uh, research in, um, you know, in uh, neurosurgery and neuro-oncology, and also epigenetics of the chronic uh, disease. That's also in our uh, great um, area of interest for me. And uh, as, as I said, I'm very excited and very uh, delighted to be part of CampSign and to uh, be taking care of the website and all the fun things you see from the uh, social media and the, uh, um, you know, internet and I'm out of words, so I guess I'll pass it to <laughs> you guys to uh, introduce the other team members. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you very much. Uh, we have also four new members uh, that are actually helping in expanding the missions of Camp Science, so maybe we can also introduce them so we can take turns and you can briefly introduce yourselves too. Yeah, for sure. So we have uh, four new incredible members, and uh, Emma, maybe you can start first. Sure. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a second year medical student at UBC's Northern Medical Program. My role with CAMSign is the communications officer, so I'm going to be a bit more in the background, just taking notes at all the events and making sure that we properly record everything that we're doing so that we can hopefully expand CAMSign and show that it's having an impact in the neurosurgical community. Um, I'm super excited to be a part of the team and I look forward to working with you guys. We are happy to have you in the team as well. So Philippe, please go next. Hi everyone, my name is Philip. I am a third year medical student at the University of Manitoba. Um, so I am the social media director uh, and uh, so we're incorporating a bunch of new exciting things. So keep your eyes uh, sort of posted to our social media site. You'll see some new um, case based challenges and so on and, and we'll be adding more and more as we go. So uh, it's pretty exciting and I'm a, a, a very happy to be a part of the group here. Awesome. Fantastic. And uh, Jas, why don't you go next? Hey guys, my name is Jazz. I'm one of the fourth year med students at uh, University of Saskatchewan. Um, very interested in neurosurgery. We'll be applying through CARMS this year. Um, my role is the senior blog manager. So I'll be working alongside of Barar. And uh, we're putting together resources for class of 21 and class of 22, um, our 22 and 23. And um, we will be putting together um, lots of resources for the CARMS uh, for, on the CAMSAN website, as well as for people uh, who will be applying later on. So uh, watch out for that. I'm just really happy to be part of this initiative. Perfect. And uh, last but not least. Yeah, please go ahead, Abra, please. Thumbs up. I think sure. may have lost connection because uh, his picture's frozen. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
So Abror is also our, uh, is he joining? He's our junior blog manager and he's going to be working with Jasleen and mm -hmm. uh, he recently summarized the paper. So we have a newsletter coming up too. That's another thing. So every month we're going to be in your inboxes. So mm -hmm. wonderful. Okay. Uh, Abar, can you hear us? I just want to make sure that no, he's, I think he's frozen. I think I'll send him a message. Okay. So, yeah. him. That's okay. Okay, great. Thank no you so much again for joining us tonight. Um, we are super excited to have Dr. Valiante with us um, for a great presentation. So we're going to just um, reach with a short bio of Dr. Valiante. And after that, uh, the stage is all um, is actually for Dr. Valiantes, and then we will be more than happy to listen to his presentation. Um, Dr. Valiante graduated from the MD-PhD program at the University of Toronto in 1997 with doctoral studies completed under the supervision of Dr. Peter Carlin at Toronto Western Research Institute. Dr. Valiante then pursued an epilepsy neurosurgery fellowship at the University of Washington, Seattle, when he learned uh, Dr. Ojman's technique of language mapping for patients undergoing epilepsy surgery. Dr. Valiante holds many positions. He's a professor, staff neurosurgeon, certain scientist at University Health Network, at Kremble Research Institute, and Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto. He's also the director of the Surgical Epilepsy Program, as well as a recent position as, recent position as the co-director of the Max Planck uh, University of Toronto Center for Neural Science and Technology, and the Center for Advancing uh, uh, Neurotechnological Innovations to Application Cranium. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, he's interested in understanding the block, the building blocks of the human brain and the ultimate manifestation of their collective activity. His collaborations with amazing scientists and students allow him to contribute to research on memory, eye movements, epilepsy, biophysical properties and neurons, computational modeling, mathematical modeling, neuromodulation, development of physical tools, and brain machine interfaces. These multi scale endeavors. Um, likely satisfy a personal desire to uh, realize the title of a very formative book int uh, introducing him to the field of experimental neuroscience entitled From Neuro Neuron to Brain, which has, uh, he has adopted as his lab's name. And, uh, and without further ado, uh, Dr. Valente, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, the stage is all yours. Uh, we'll begin with the presentation and then we can um, have a Q&A at the very end. So, uh, Pedro, I'm just uh, remind me, it's an hour, about an hour, is it, right, the talk? Yep, that's right. Okay. Great. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, very happy to be here. Uh, my slides might be, I may have too many of them. Uh, I wanted to edit them, but I was running into, my internet went down about an hour and a half ago, and I've been struggling to get that. So I didn't really be able to filter them uh, as, as um, and make it as succinct as I would like. But uh, anyway, you'll get a, a full flavor of kind of what, what goes on. Um, so I think today is going to be a bit of a combo, right? I'm going to go kind of through the things that led me here and then give you a bit of a survey uh, in regards to some of the things that I'm very, very grateful for uh, being, being part of uh, and this kind of emerging, what I would call a new technology ecosystem within, uh, within Toronto. So, um, no, um, so this is kind of the place, the space I, I play in. And I think the one thing I want to really mention here uh, is uh, the centrality of the epilepsy program here. And uh, this really was uh, something that uh, had to be built before I kind of built my research uh, program around. Um, and I think the key thing with this is not so much all the, all the lines and all the things that are associated with it, but kind of something I learned very early on as, as a surgeon, which is, uh, but I mean, other surgeon scientists have you know, done it differently, is that uh, my research was and always conceptualized um, at least later in my career, to be really predicated on things within the clinical realm. And epilepsy provides uh, a very unique opportunity um, to mix the two where the OR and the patients in whom, you know, we have the opportunity to implant electrodes really uh, become, you know, intimately involved in the scientific, uh, in the scientific process. And I guess I want to sort of tell you a little bit more my phenotype and what I think I am uh, and why, and then because as some of you uh, are sort of along that pathway and the things that kind of led me to, to uh, where I am now. And, and I want to go through sort of a bit of a, you know, a very formative uh, story for me, which is, you know, wh why do I think I'm a computational neuroscientist and what does computation uh, mean to me? And, and if they haven't seen this video, I strongly 
uh, recommended by uh, Simon Sinek. And uh, basically the premise of at least what I got from this video uh, was that most people can tell you what they do and most people can tell you how they do what they do, uh, but very few people can tell you can tell you why they do what they do. Um, and I think, you know, like, you know, for me simplistically is that, you know, I'm a neurosurgeon. How do I do that? I use micro neurosurgical technique. I use my knowledge of anatomy, blah, blah, blah. But the why is very different. What brought me to neurosurgery was really a deep desire since I was a kid to really understand uh, the brain. And that it goes way back to, you know, my, in my uh, early, early teens. And uh, I think what blew my mind was uh, when I was uh, in my third year of undergrad, um, and my undergrad was in physics and biology. Um, and I came across this guy, this guy, Jack Dainty. And, and Jack Dainty actually started out in, as a physicist and then switched into, I think, you know, studying um, in nuclear stuff or what was he studying? Uh, you know, something around in, within that uh, space. And then he moved to basically plant biology. And I remember having all these discussions with him. And, uh, you know, I remember one day he gave me um, a manuscript of his where he, he demonstrated using mathematics that there was this layer beside biological membranes that remains unstirred. And, you know, I was just, I was, you know, young at that time. And I think it completely, I mean, I always had a predilection towards math and physics, but it really kind of solidified my mind that what it allows you to do is to describe the physical world It's you know, this conceptual exercise, but it tells you about the physical world. And I think that just for me has always been now what computational uh, means to me. And then I think the second sort of epiphany was when I started my PhD, which was reading the original papers by Hodgkin and Huxley. And I think that what, what was incredible about the work uh, that they did was, uh, was that they not only planned the biological experiments, but they built the amplifiers and the technology to actually do it. And then they did the experiments and then they did the computational modeling. And then they derived, you know, these now these famous, famous equations for which uh, they got the Nobel Prize. And I think that, I think, again, as a, you know, a young person, it was this, and, you know, there was, I remember this line in one of these papers where they postulate that, you know, there's X number of gating channels for activation and, and X for inactivation. And that was based from the math. And they, and they predicted the physical structure of these molecules. And I think it was just, it was mind boggling for me uh, at that time. So it was second really, you know, major um, experience in my life as, as, a, as a student. You know, and then they, you know, I just find this interesting. They, they integrate all these differential equations by hand to do these, these plots. And then, you know, I did kind of my, um, you know, my, my contribution uh, to this, which is, you know, really for me was like the best I could have done, I could do during my PhD, which is I, I derived the uh, rate equations for uh, the ch channel gating of a channel, which was very hard to actually do patch clamp recordings on. And I derived the power spectra that should be associated with the specific open and closed times. And then I did the experiments and then I fitted the, the stuff to my, my models and I extracted out single channel parameters from this actually, uh, you know, which I was you know, very, very proud of was these, uh, these very noisy recordings. I was able to actually you know, extract out uh, single channel properties from, from this population of stochastic noise. So, so that was like for me and it, you know, I, for me it kind of, fulfilled my, you know, I, maybe whatever responsibility I felt was what I saw in other people, which is this, you know, to take the math, to create the, the formulation of that, to do the experiments, and then to, you know, ultimately describe the physical world. Um, so then, you know, after that, uh, you know, just five years, it was wonderful. I mean, it's just an amazing time during my, my PhD. I then uh, uh, did clinical, me finished medical school, then did my, um, residency in Toronto, and then I went off to work with Dr. Ojeman, who, you know, very proudly, I you know, drive my surgical lineage uh, to, to, our, to Wilder Penfield through uh, Dr. Ojeman and then Arthur Ward. And Arthur Ward was, you know, was one of the first people to do single cell recordings in the operating room in patients uh, with epilepsy. He trained George Ojeman, and then George Ojeman trained me. And in fact, Arthur Ward was Wilder Penfield's fellow and built the old operating room in Seattle, Washington, where I went. To the specifications of the MNI, which was, you know, really remarkable. It was fascinating for me, um, you know, when I went there. And then I came back uh, to Toronto. Th then I then I came back to Toronto, uh, and then uh, what I realized was was that I really didn't have 
much of an epilepsy program to actually do the work that, that I want to do. And then began a, a very kind of long pathway as sort of a lobbyist. And so I, I uh, had to sort of do the lobbying for the philanthropy to actually build the first version of it. Um, and then I got very involved uh, with the Ministry of Health here in Ontario, where I sort of created this model of epilepsy care through the province, uh, which was based on chronic disease management principles, which ultimately was adopted. And in Ontario now, we actually have the only regionalized approach to epilepsy, uh, which brought additional funding and further expansion of the epilepsy monitoring unit, uh, to which is now a 10-bed epilepsy monitoring unit, uh, which is comparable to London, so really amongst the largest uh, in, in Canada. And by that time, I was kind of ready to, you know, do do what I wanted to do. Um, but uh, you know, I I, I have I have a very secure this path, and I always give this talk to the MDPC students because that's how I went through the MDPC program, and you know, I've made every mistake into becoming a clinician scientist. So I have a whole talk, you know, on this, and I won't I won't go through it. Um, but you know, the things I learned, you know, building the program uh, was it has very little to do with sort of rational arguments about need and statistics and, you know, um, under service and stuff like that. It has a lot to do really around, you know, being a champion for a community, uh, you know, getting donors to really understand, you know, what the problems that are and really speaking at the emotional level and talking about, uh, you know, pa patient stories. And so it was just, it was another skill, which, you know, really, um, I, I, di I didn't know, I had, had not learned that at that, at that time. You know, when I started my fellowship in Seattle, I got exposed to this, which was, again, just another thing that completely blew my mind. On the right-hand side here, in fact, you'll see that there is um, this, this, these micro wires in the temporal lobe of a patient recording single units. Um, and this is Dr. Ogenman uh, up here. Um, uh, and this is the OR built to the specifications of, uh, of Wilder Penfield. Um, and that was, that was again an epiphany for me. And I had come from a basic science PhD. I was gonna study um, rats and mice and do single cell recording, whole cell recordings. And I walked into the OR and, and I saw this and I just, I just said, I, I just have to do this. It's just, it's just something I have to do. And so in fact, I rewrote my, my clinician scientist CHR award uh, while I was in Seattle because I was applying at that time for the following year. And, you know, and I, and I was going to study memory now, and I wasn't going to do whole cell recordings. And, you know, it was all this kind of crazy stuff about completely changing, you know, what, what, what I would have done scientifically as compared to my PhD. And so this led me to sort of another mistake, which was kind of trying to recreate myself into something that I wasn't. And so I really thought I could become an experimental psychologist. I would design tasks to study the brain, something I had never learned through my PhD or or through uh, medical school or through residency was just an absolute lack of understanding of how you actually probe uh, the brain from a behavioral perspective. And so I struggled with that for, for many years. And, and then I finally actually came across this, you know, this quote, which, you know, for me, there's all these very, you know, very specific events in my life, which I can sort of say were bifurcations, if you want to call it that in my path. And it was this quote here by a guy named Victor Lamb, and he said, he was talking about consciousness and he said to accept this definition of consciousness we need to let go of our intuitive in, intuitive or psychological notions of consciousness and let the neuroscience arguments have their, their way and you know I, I came from a cellular electrophysiology point of view I could not in my mind understand what memory was or short-term memory or or whatever it didn't have any meaning to me because I didn't form I didn't grow up with those constructs and so I basically retreated in a way uh, back to what I knew, which was, you know, trying to think of how am I going to recreate myself within what I had learned in my fellowship and what my strengths were, which were really the cell electrophysiology and, and my strengths uh, computationally. And so this is, you know, um, a title of a talk. And, and almost every time I, I give a talk, I, I actually title it this. It's very disingenuous. But, uh, and, and strangely enough, this is a, a title of a book that Ojiman that Arthur Ward wrote with a colleague of his. And strangely enough, when I was, when I was interviewing for my uh, fellowship, uh, Dr. Ogerman said, so why do you wanna do epilepsy surgery? And I'm like, well, it's like a window to the brain. And he just kind of looks at me and I wasn't aware of this book at that time. So he must've thought I was some kind of sycophantic suck up or something like that. But, but, but you know, epilepsy provides you, provides us, provides science an unprecedented 
access to the human brain. And you'll just give you examples on this slide where you know, we can put these large cortical arrays on. I can record electrophysiological response in the OR here. You know, we can do electrical stimulation mapping. And you know, this was the premise really of this book here, which you know, while the Penfield is credited for mapping out the homunculus, but so many other um, findings in this book, it's really a fascinating book uh, to read through. There, every, every second line is a nature or science paper. Uh, you know, uh, he even talks about sort of free will and you know, stimulating, you know, a sense of urgency to do something. You know, it's it's, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating book. So at this time, then I sort of found, started to think about a middle ground, and the middle ground had something to do with my clinical practice, something to do with neuropsychology. I wasn't totally sure about that. And for sure, I was going to do something, you know, electrophysiologically. And so I got very fascinated by cortical oscillations, which, you know, is really, you know, a, a big thing in neuroscience now, uh, which is really describing collective brain activity and then correlating those dynamical changes in oscillatory brain activity to some sort of, some sort of behavioral outcome and to then demonstrate that there's a specific oscillation that changes if you remember this or forget that. And so you can sort of ascribe, you know, these oscillations a function. And so I kind of joke that, you know, I, I have this graph, which I, I didn't put, the, actually, I should have, I forgot to put the actual, the funny part of this, but I have a picture of Gall. Uh, this guy Gall was uh, around the time of um, uh, Broca, and he was arguing that if you feel the bumps on the head, you could actually tell something about a person, this was called phrenology. And so I sort of joke about oscillatory phrenology, which is that, Along here, you'll see a bunch of frequencies, and they have different names, of course, depending on the on the frequency. And then they're ascribed to specific cognitive functions. Um, and you know, this is undergird, you know, a huge amount of uh, cognitive neuropsychology and our understanding uh, of the brain. And there's very specific theories around this, particularly the communication through coherence hypothesis, uh, which says the two U regions of the brain that are coherently oscillating together are communicating together. And this type of analysis is done exploiting something which you're all probably familiar with, which is, which is fMRI, and to build up sort of cortical networks like default mode networks, et cetera, et cetera, from fMRI data. But we do it on a, on a faster time scale electrophysiology because the oscillations are, in fact, much, much uh, quicker than the, the bold fluctuations we see uh, in fMRI. So the oscillations really captured my, you know, my attention at that time and very lucky. And you know, I think this is the important thing, which you know, I think we all think we're super awesome because we got here and we're great at what we do, but, you know, we really have been shepherded by our experience and the people around us, you know, and the interactions that we've had through our career. And so I actually got, I actually ran into literally uh, this guy, Thilo Wommelsdorf, and Thilo had actually published some of the seminal papers on the communication through coherence hypothesis. I was just starting to do intracranial recordings in patients, and I was getting my hands wet again in programming because I, I love coding. Uh, and I was starting to write my own analyses to, to start analyzing some of the intracranial data that I was getting uh, from my patients. And we started to talk about these kinds of ideas. And then we sort of started to think about how could we describe the kind of things that we see, especially given the fact that we have emerging types of technologies like optogenetics, much more sophisticated tools for mapping circuits uh, structurally, like you know, rabies and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And can we sort of create a formalism around you know, the kind of oscillatory signatures that we see? And so we came up with this. Thing. And this was kind of like my first big return back to science. It was just a, a wonderful experience. And I think that, you know, I hope you'll all have that experience to work with somebody or collaborate with people, you know, who really sort of bring the best uh, out of you. And, and, you know, Thilo has been, you know, just a great friend as well. So we, so we got this and it was, you know, re really great for me. I got surveyed, you know, I was coming out of, you know, many years of not doing science and I was getting back to coding and it just helped me, you know, refresh all my cellular to physiology and we get this compendium basically of uh, frequencies and what kind of specific circuits underlie that. We came up with this inventory and this kind of approach, which we call a dynamical uh, circuit motif. And then around that time, I was thinking, you know, wh what can I do and how can I contribute? And I think the one thing which really struck me and it came after a visiting professor came, which is that I need to somehow really exploit my surgical access to patients because I'm not going to compete with a PhD scientist who's got, you know, 100% of the time that they're working in the lab and, you know, they have, you know, unlimited, you know, time to, well, not unlimited, that's, a, that's an exaggeration, but, you know, at least twice the time that I have to do stuff. And so, you know, what is my value add? And so I learned through another, you know, uh, colleague of mine, who's a, a neurosurgeon in Iowa, 
that I really should be focusing on the things that I can do uniquely. And the one thing uniquely, which I already mentioned, which is access to the human brain. So in fact, I started really asking a very simple question, which was, can I generate oscillations within small cortical blocks, which I was resecting at the time of epilepsy surgery? And this was kind of like my really first step finally back into science after, you know, probably about 20, if not almost up to 20 years of being out of it. I did my, finished my PhD in 1997. So, so this started, and in fact, it's a very cellular electrophysiological, it was, it was within my wheelhouse. It was something I, you know, I was comfortable with. The long and short of it was, was that, you know, um, with, with and through these experiments to try to recreate oscillations, you know, I care, we characterized human cortical tissue. We showed that it was alive and we showed that the cell types are similar to what you can record in the, in the rodent. Um, you know, we showed that it generates spontaneous activity. Uh, so it was, you know, the networks were intact. And then we showed kind of what I was hoping to show, which is in fact that these slices do generate sort of meaningful oscillations that are similar to those that you record uh, in vivo, uh, in the human. And so we're actually able to recreate through sort of pharmacological manipulation uh, oscillations within small cortical uh, slices. We also showed though that these slices could generate epilep epileptiform activity uh, and distinguish the two um, of types of activity. And you know, the major finding was uh, that really we could generate you know, power spectra, which are basically representations of the power within a specific frequency that look like the awake human brain or maybe the idling human brain. So that was kind of exciting. But the one cool thing which we saw was these oscillations were actually synchronous between the superficial and deep layers. And what we showed with some simple math which was the deep layer activity seemed to drive this whole entire circuit. And around that time, there was this sort of paper that came out in science, uh, which demonstrated this phenomenon, and I won't go into the details of it, but basically how low frequency oscillations and train higher frequency oscillations and what this idea, which is called phase amplitude coupling. And it was this idea that things that are being processed at slow temporal scales are then actually modulating things at higher temporal scales. And it's a way of binding activity, it's occurring at different temporal scales, basically. Uh, and this is sort of this, this is the figures from the sort of the seminal paper. And not, not that it's important to, to, to know what this is, but just that we're actually able to show the signature that was in the human brain, in the awake human brain, we're actually able to show that in these small cortical slices. And I won't go through the, the math on that. So, so we were actually able to, so that was kind of the first step for me, you know, getting back. And so we published this first stuff in cerebral cortex and I was very happy uh, about that. And then we sort of actually used the same data set to demonstrate something which for me was kind of interesting at the time in that field, which was there was this idea of linking temporal scales, which was low frequency oscillations to high frequency oscillations. But there was also this coherence business, which I told you about that different regions of the brain when they oscillate coherently together, it's thought that they're communicating together. And I thought that this all must be part of one thing where coherence actually then governs local computation. And so we started actually looking at that and I won't go through in detail on, the, on these kinds of things. Um, but, but basically, uh, I'll show you the, the real, uh, real graph here. So this is kind of like an exemplary figure and you can actually see here very clearly like this is activity in the superficial layer, this is activity in the deep layer. And it waxes and wanes almost synchronously with, 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 with one another. And this is on a very open time scale. And you actually see this high frequency activity here. And then you've got this slow frequency envelope here. And so this high frequency activity occurs at a very specific phase of this uh, low frequency activity. And so when we actually look at the phase coherence between these regions of the brain, we actually see that this orange line grows, it waxes and wanes. And it actually waxes and wanes with the strength of this phase amplitude coupling, which is a coupling of high frequency amplitude to low frequency phase. At, at, at the end of the day, what we really showed was, was that in fact, indeed coherence is actually strongly coupled to phase amplitude coupling and that these, all these things represent sort of a singular unified uh, kind of thing. So from this then came specific hypotheses about what are the cell types that are actually mediating these types of ideas. And we know that there's a canonical architecture uh, of, uh, of uh, neocortical, uh, of neocortex. And so we started thinking, what might be the cell types that drive this kind of activity? And, and this is sort of work that's 
done by a fantastic postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Homero Moradi, who's really a, a master uh, at electrophysiology, and she drives many of the techn technology, technological aspects in, in my lab. And so again, the long and short of it is after patching, after about six years, seven years of work and you know, patching several hundred neurons, uh, we're able to sort of you know, publish this paper which demonstrated sort of the diversity of human cell types. And I'm gonna get into that a little bit why that's uh, important, but really you know, amongst one of the first characterizations about uh, regarding neurons across the entire cortex and what makes them similar and what makes them different. And you know, with a real a great colleague of mine who's a computational genomicist, we did some you know fancy bioinformatics kind of stuff and showing that in fact we tend to think that cell types are very um, distinct, but in fact, there's this gradient of cell types. It's very difficult to, to say, given a set of electrophysiological features, that this cell is from layer two or this cell is from, from layer six. Nonetheless, though, we, we kind of proved one of our hypotheses, which is that these deep layer neurons down here are actually very, very different than the superficial neurons. Um, and, and so we sort of came up with this putative circuit that demonstrates kind of the theta oscillations uh, that, we, uh, that we described. And then, um, you know, we, we kind of, so what's embedded in this, which I didn't get into because I don't want to get too granular, but, you know, there's one specific current that was really sort of dominating the distinction between these different cell types. And so we were curious as how, to, how does it functionally uh, manifest itself in human cells? And so we started down this pathway of actually trying to create a human inspired cell model, which is really where the field is trying to go to, which is, you know, the, the Blue Brain Project and the Human Brain Project are trying to sort of create, you know, large scale simulations. And, and I think that if you're going to have relevance to the human brain, you should have human inspired parameters. And so this was kind of our first step in that direction. And I think the really cool thing that came out of this was, was that when we tried to fit these models and, and, and those Hodgkin Huxley equations, you know, that were derived way back when, and we tried to use rodent kinetics, it wouldn't fit with the human, uh, human models that we created. And so kind of what we, what we found out, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, this is done, uh, very important to, to mention the people involved. This is Frances Skinner, who's actually a computational neuroscientist. She has her office beside me in Kremble. Uh, she's a co-supervisor of, my, my, of, uh, of Scott, who's a math, mathematician. He comes from pure math. Uh, background and is now recreating himself as a, a computational neuroscientist and, and Homera. And so uh, the long and short of it with all these kind of optimization approaches and blah, 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 we actually showed that the human H current was very, very different than the rodent H current uh, with very difficult, different features. And so, and I think this is really where, again, sort of speaks to this kind of, you know, intuitive thing I feeling I have for computational neuroscience, which is through the math and through the experiment, through really the math really, we're able to show that probably the human H channel has a very distinct uh, kinetic, kinetic profile and probably is then biophysically distinct from the, the rodent H channel. Okay, so I know that's a lot, but I wanted to sort of give you a little bit of a, a sampling of the other things that are done in the lab. and. In fact, my lab has four different pillars in it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm that kind of person who uh, can comfortably say I'm, I'm on the fence on everything really uh, in a way. Um, but uh, the four pillars in my lab are really the neurobiological experiments, which are already sort of led me to this, you know, state that I'm in now. We have a whole pillar that's actually devoted to intracranial human recordings. And I'll, I'll take you through some of that data as well. We do this now robotically at the Toronto Western. This is S, we do SEG. Uh, this is a brain machine interface, which I'll talk about, and we actually can get single cell recording the human brain uh, chronically over time over many weeks as they're in the epilepsy learning unit. We have a computational pillar, of course, as you've, you've seen one example of that. And in fact, there's a very kind of translational part of the lab, which is this neuromodulation pillar, um, which I will sort of tell you about some of the goodies that have, uh, have come out of that. So I want to tell you about, you know, not so much about the results, but how we exploit now these kinds of recordings now. This is now not the slice in the it slices in a dish, but this is direct recordings from the human brain, and really kind of for me sort of satisfies when I first was in Dr. Ojiman's lab or in his operating room. This this kind of study of the human brain at the electrophysiological scale. These electrodes, in fact, you can record both local field potential, which is macroscopic population activity, 
as well as single unit activity. And so we developed, started developing this idea in saccadic eye movements, really not in a vacuum. And I can't claim to you know, have thought about that, but through a great collaboration, again, with an individual at York University, she happened to be the partner of Thilo Wommelsdorf, who's my buddy who we wrote that kind of review. And so we were starting to think about what kind of translational stuff can we do between human and non-human primate? And she's a non-human primate researcher. And so we started, we deployed this task, uh, not only in monkeys, but in humans. And we actually showed something at that time, which was actually, and I won't go into detail here because I'll, I'll show you more contemporary stuff, but in fact, um, that there's a very specific signal in the memory structure of the human brain that are associated with each and every time you move your eyeball. And that's actually super fascinating because there's an incredibly large psychophysical literature that, that talks about the intimate relationship between eye movements and mnemonic structures in the brain and, and memory per se, but never was any electrophysiological signature really demonstrated in the human uh, brain. And so it kind of gave us our first inclination about this intimate link between uh, eye movements and, and, and memory structures. And this comes out of a collaboration with, uh, you know, another great collaborator of mine, she's in the Department of Psychology. And as you're starting to get probably an idea is that, you know, I, I have the luxury of collaborating with, you know, people who know a lot more about stuff than I do, uh, you know, and she really brings an amazing uh, background from an experimental psychology point of view. She's a very strong memory researcher. And so we develop a task to study eye movements in more detail. And what we were able to show was in fact, that this specific signature that occurs with each and every eye movement in fact starts before the eye moves. And so this is an anticipatory signal. It's an internally generated signal. It is not driven by external visual stimuli. And these types of signals are actually well known, although never described in the human hippocampus. And these are known as corollary discharges. And they're thought to contain a copy of the motor signal that's actually sent to the ocular motor system and it starts to cue different parts of the brain that the eyes are moving and new information is gonna be received uh, uh, by the brain. So then we've taken the next step now, which is to ask, we have a now, we have a, actually an idea circuit. Uh, we have proposed a circuit that underlies, you know, these electrophysiological signatures, signatures that we see here. I don't know why my, my pointer is so slow here, but um, you know, these, these electrophysiological signatures, we have a proposed circuit and now we can actually explore that circuit because we can actually do single cell recordings in the human brain. And so these are the little micro wires here. These are the Benke Fried electrodes. These are 30 micron platinum iridium wires. And these are the macro electrodes, these large silver things, which are the clinical electrodes from which we perform the clinical recordings. This is a really great colleague of mine, Sunil Kalia, who uh, I operate with. We do this robotically now uh, where we implant these electrodes. It's really a two person thing because I prepare all these micro wires and then we implant them uh, together. The long and short of it is, is that we have this kind of putative circuit and we've actually demonstrated now some of the major sort of hypotheses from this actually hold true with our analyses. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears. Sorry, I'm switching so many gears, but it's... So, so the other big pillar in my lab is neuromodulation. And again, you know, I have a really great collaboration with Roman Genov, who's a professor of electrical and computer engineering. And this really comes out of this deep desire uh, to um, create devices that uh, can, can uh, detect when a seizure is happening and stop those seizures. And these are really considered closed loop devices where the device has is recording something meaningful from the brain, is decoding it in some way, and then is acting meaningfully on the brain to stop some type of activity or augment some type of uh, beneficial activity. And the current state of the field is that there's two closed loop devices right now one is uh, the called the RNS or, or the responsive nerve stimulator from Neuropace, and the other is the Levanova, the Vegas nerve stimulator. As you will see here, none of them really render people seizure free. And arguably, the RNS system generates three, 600 to 2,000 uh, false positives per day, which basically means that it's stimulating the brain constantly. So it's not really a closed loop device, it's really an open loop device that is constantly stimulating the brain. So we were motivated uh, by that. We think that this field, there's a lot to be done. And one of the crazy things is, is that the RNS system, this system on the left here, which has a, lot, a huge research potential, not only a therapeutic potential, is actually not Health Canada approved. So Canadians don't have access to this system. And in fact, us as scientists and clinicians don't have access to the kind of data that these devices can record. 
So we're also motivated by the fact that you know there's a there's a population of people don't who don't have access uh, to this, um, and that we want to fill that niche. And so this is some really amazing work by uh, Gerard O'Leary. Gerard's a uh, a PhD student in the lab. He's uh, from electrical and computer engineering. He spent four years in industry first designing computer chips and then came back to academia. And with Gerard, we've spun out a company called Nervex Neurotechnologies. And we have two sort of main uh, devices we're interested in. One is uh, ultimately to deploy as an implantable device uh, in first dogs and then ultimately in human. We actually have our first prototype here, uh, which looks a bigger than you than it looks like in this figure, um, but it's probably the sign of, size of uh, a, a loony and a half, basically, a tuny, uh, a tuny and a half, basically. Um, and, and this is our first uh, uh, target is animals because you have a, a collaboration with a, a vet, a vet uh, um, in, in Toronto. They have a, it's called Alum Animal Health Partners. And the second is a very fascinating or very cool uh, experimental platform here uh, which is to do kind of research which we don't have the technology to do right now. Um, and so we've kind of built the next generation of devices for ourselves uh, to do the kind of experiments which we can't yet do with hardware that's available commercially. And this is called UNIT, which is a microelectrode neural interface system. And it's actually designed from the ground up to interface with the chips that are being designed that are going to be implanted in the devices and also to interface with hardware, physical tools that are being developed with collaborators, for example, like Joyce Poon, who's in, um, in the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics. She's a director uh, of that. So we're thinking sort of ahead into the, kind of the next generation of neural probes. And this kind of hardware is designed from the ground up to interface to those new types of neural interfaces. And I don't know if you know, but the Allen Institute just in fact, just announced a new institute, sorry, the Allen uh, just announced a new institute was called the Allen Institute for Neural Dynamics. And this institute goes beyond the cell typing activities, which they're super well known for, which is really creating a catalog of cell types, but now taking that next step into behavior. And that was going to require new physical tools. Um, and so I think we're really seeing this, you know, sort of emerging um, technological focus um, that's going to be done on large scale now by, by places like the, the Allen Institute. Um, the other thing I want to talk to you about is sort of a, an interest, it's along the same line as neuromodulation, but it's really around brain machine interfaces. Um, and this is sort of a study that developed with just a fantastic uh, MD PhD student in my lab, Kreme Patel. Kreme comes from an engineering background uh, and now has actually gone back to uh, medical school. Um, and it was a simple idea was like, you know, neurofeedback is being used for many conditions, it's actually being used for epilepsy. Uh, but not with great sort of feedback signals. And we thought maybe if we can get down to the cellular level, maybe we can actually create better indices for neurofeedback um, treatments. Um, the project was actually realized in a very fascinating way. We actually developed an instrumental learning task. Uh, and the long and short of it is, and I won't go through this, but the thing about this brain machine interface, it's super cool because basically we have these signals coming from the electrodes implanted in the individual with epilepsy. We're sorting them and classifying them in real time. So there's a real time component to this. We're then actually sort of convolving these with a Gaussian kernel to get the average smooth firing rate. We're using that firing rate to sort of, uh, to, sorry, to determine the height of this box. So if the firing rate of that neuron goes down, the box goes down. If the firing rate goes up, the box goes up. And all we do is we ask the person to control the height of the box. And surprisingly, they can learn to control a single neuron in their brain. Out of 80 billion neurons, they somehow can access, address, and control it voluntarily. And so this paper just came out in Brain. It's a fascinating paper. I hope, hope you will take a look at it. It's just kind of mind boggling, even as I think about it right now. And you know, we've had some fascinating discussions with other scientists through the world. What, what could this mean for machine learning algorithms? Um, can machine learning out in the current state, can they actually do this? So we're actually very interested to sort of actually explore this uh, scientifically. Um, I won't go through that nitty gritty detail. And I'll leave it here because you know, I, I could go on, but I want to also, because this is a New York technology and sort of a big picture talk too, I want to take you into some of the sort of exciting things, which 
you know, things that are things that you could possibly be, be part of if, if you ultimately choose to sort of do, uh, you know, further research. And so I have very fortunately stumbled into these environments. I'd like to believe because, um, well, I, I don't know like what I'd like to believe. I like to believe I'm lucky. I mean, I think I'm, you know, fortunate uh, in that way. But, but I think that the time was ripe in Toronto and, you know, we just found like-minded people. And so the one person, which, oh, I, I forgot to put his, his main up, but Milos Popovic down here is a good buddy of mine where we we're actually submitting grants to the hospital. And the person reviewing the grants was like, hey, you two want, seem like you want to do the same thing. You guys should meet each other. So we met. And then out of this came this Crania grant, which is a $16.5 million CFI grant. And we got $5 million of donation to start running it which is really around creating a center to advance neuro techn technology. And you know, you guys know that, you know, the, the, the interest in the brain now from a governmental point of view and funding point of view is not altruistic and idealistic. It is because it's such a burden to society from an economic uh, perspective. And so in fact, if you look throughout the world, uh, neurological conditions uh, have greater uh, disability adjusted life years than uh, heart disease and cancer combined. Okay, so and as the population grows, it's going to get you know even worse. And so we're both from a neuromodulation kind of background. I love the physics behind it, whatever. He comes from neuromodulation. He's developed devices for functional electrical stimulation. And basically, I mean, neuromodulation has a very specific physiological definition, but in the medical field or medical surgical perspective, it's really some kind of device internally implanted or external that modulates brain activity. Currently, the main modality is electricity. Magnetic fields are also you know, uh, being used. Now maybe high frequency ultrasound. So there's a bunch of ways of sort of doing neuromodulation. And so um, there are some established devices. I already talked about one, which is on the right-hand side, that, that there's deep brain stimulation, which you'd have to be living under a rock if you don't haven't heard about that. And then this functional electrical stimulation, which has been demonstrated to be uh, very uh, effective in, in stroke rehabilitation. So there's a lot, there's a, there's stuff emerging there. And interestingly, it's an exploding field. Like it's like, there's actually a, a you know, some of these large companies coined this term electroceuticals, uh, which is that, you know, basically everything's connected to the nervous system. And there's been anecdotal studies, for example, where near vagus nerve stimulated stimulation devices have demonstrated uh, uh, decreased uh, inflammatory markers uh, remission of some of the um, inflammatory bowel disease symptoms, Crohn's disease, celiac disease. There's a whole bunch of potential indications for, for neuromodulation outside of the kind of things that we're doing uh, right now. But you can see the list here and you can see there the expanding list of applications. And it's a growing market. So there's a lot of money that's being spent on neuromodulation for the promise of a device that uh, might be better than a drug. And uh, it's programmable, it's modifiable, it can be turned on, it can be turned off. It doesn't cause a, 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 you know, a known or distinct lesion, like a lesioning uh, kind of intervention. So, and, and the cool thing is, I think from a scientific point of view, is that these devices, in fact, enable us to do incredible amount of research to push this technology further. Um, and I think that's one of the very exciting things about this type of technology is not only its potential therapeutic benefit, but, um, what we can learn about about the brain given the kind of horsepower that we can now stuff into a small device and and implant it and so at the time you know we realized that you know in toronto there's just you know we have incredible engineering uh, faculty we have really a long track record in neuromodulation doing cl clinical trials so you know very strong clinical uh, uh partnership that could be established strong material science and of course as you know with the vector institute and stuff like that very strong machine learning uh, in Toronto. So we want to bring these things together, which then we did, and we call that uh, Crania. I'm not gonna go through this because it's way too much detail, but I will tell you about the other kind of thing which I've become very passionate about, and really is about education. And I really feel that it's not gonna be me uh, who's gonna really make the next big, you know, scientific breakthroughs or figure the brain or whatever. It's gonna be you guys, you guys and gals, men and women, who will work on these things, who bring new ideas uh, to this. And so we've actually created the Cranial Neuromodulation Institute, which is um, an institute uh, dedicated to advancing uh, uh, studies in neuromodulation. It offers now a new course that we created uh, that I 
uh, I uh, direct with uh, Luka Milosevic, who's a, a new early career researcher. We have created a new course, which is called BME 1500, which is topics in neuromodulation, which is ongoing right now. And it's super fun. Uh, in fact, our enrollment, we got 100% uh, enrollment in less than 24 hours. So we definitely think there's a need for, for these types of things. And in fact, we're going to be creating, we're in the process of creating a collaborative specialization, which means that if you do a degree, you know, maybe a master's degree or PhD degree, you could actually then get a designation on your transcript uh, uh, in neuromodulation because we will create this collaborative specialization. So that's some of the you know, exciting things from a, um, you know, an educational uh, perspective. And we really think that there's not enough of that in Toronto and we really want to get people early to sort of get that bug when it comes to computational neuroscience and te technologies. I know for many of you, because I know ultimately when you become residents and stuff like that, you know, everybody gravitates to oncology and everybody gravitates to clinical epidemiology. But, you know, I think there's, if you have a computational bent, um, you know, I think this is, and, a, and a, maybe a physics kind of bent or, or you don't have, I mean, there's people I know like George Ibrahim, who, you know, is very strong computational neuroscientist, sick in hospital, and he had no coding background. Um, and during his PhD, he's become really, a, you know, amazingly powerful computational neuroscientist. So I think that, you know, there are skills that can be picked up. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter uh, how, how old how old one is or where you're along in your in your trajectory. And then the last thing which I want to talk to you about, which is really you know super exciting for us, which is this uh, international uh, degree program, which uh, uh, was created with again, you know, I can't I can't mention her enough. She's just a, a powerhouse of a scientist, uh, Joyce Poon, who uh, is uh, was a professor, is a professor here still at, in electrical computer engineering, but got sort of uh, scoped out. Um, and uh, selected uh, to be a Max Planck director, which is insanely amazing. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know what it's like professionally, but, you know, it's like, it's like you don't even apply for a job like this. They, they find you, right? And then they, they secretly interview you because they invite you to a meeting. So, so she's, she's that, kind of, that kind of remarkable uh, scientist. But through her um, appointment and also through our collaboration, which started kind of around the Crania time, um, we created this center and it's a very unique center. It's, uh, you know, one of 23 in the world. And at the inauguration, the, the Max Planck um, president, you know, identified something very unique about the center because it is a multidisciplinary center. Whereas if you know about the Max Planck Society, you know that they focus on, they focus on one thing and they focus on it deeply, right? So, you know, the fundamental organization of matter. Oh, what's that? Was that a question? Sorry. I don't know. Maybe somebody's uh, mic was on. Um, so, so it's very unique and it really speaks to the um, multidisciplinary nature of neuroscience. So it is unique in the world in that way as, as a center. So we got real money behind it. And really the, um, the, the mission of it is to sort of create new physical tools to study the brain, new computational tools to decode, and of course, ways of manipulating the brain and doing neurobiological experiments that have not been done before. And the lines well with other, you know, emerging things in neuroscience. You look at the Brain Initiative by the NIH Brain Initiative. I mean, it's not a new idea, but I think Toronto is a great place because we have really amazing stuff that's going on here. And our vision, of course, is scientific excellence, multidisciplinary, of course, and really an open, innovative, and collaborative uh, approach to science. Um, this was the inauguration. If you get a chance, you can watch the inauguration on, on YouTube. Um, and then maybe amongst one of the last slide is just to highlight kind of this emerging ecosystem within Toronto. We have now Crania, we have Max Planck, we have the CNMI. And in fact, now this kind of momentum is really coming to the attention of the university as a whole. And in fact, now we have ongoing discussions uh, around creating an institutional initiative around neurosciences. And, and I'd like to believe that these kind of activities with, you know, not just pie in the sky, but, you know, real stuff happening with real money behind them is driving this kind of renewed interest. And I think if you look around the world too, you'll see like major, major university centers, major neurosurgical centers are getting large endowments around building neuroscience buildings and neurotechnology centers and neural engineering buildings and, you know, this kind of thing. So, you know, the, the writing is on the wall and, you know, I think that I got very lucky that I chose functional neurosurgery because 
it is really uh, the growth area right now. Um, you know, of course, I do. I don't have a horse in the race because I do both. I do everything basically. I do all sorts of intracranial surgery. And strangely enough, I have a subspecialty which is minimally invasive spine surgery. So I'm actually the one of the few neurosurgeons in Toronto that actually does MIS, MIS surgery, which is kind of super bizarre because the residents are like, "Wow, we come to your ER because we don't, we won't learn MIS." stuff anywhere else. So it's kind of really weird. So, but the cool thing about the MIS surgery is actually very technologically driven. So when I do the single level T lifts, for example, instrumented fusions, it's very heavily dependent on 3D neural navigation, navigated instruments and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool because it's got that technology uh, uh, piece behind it. And uh, that's, that's basically it for me. Uh, if you want more interest information about the Max Planck, you guys are all on Twitter. I'm sure you know all about this, but I just stole this slide from today's talk because we just gave a, uh, an information thing for the university to sort of start to solicit for projects. Um, so, yeah. So that's it. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Valiante. That was this fantastic presentation. Uh, personally, I enjoyed every moment of that. My passion for physics and neurosurgery meets in your talk, and I'm super right. excited about that. Thank you so much. <laughs> And uh, we are great to have you as a, like a, as a first um, uh, guest for, for our new series of uh, creativity, innovation, and neurotechnology. So I'm going to pass the stage to my colleague, Saman, to open the Q&A um, session. Oh, OK, great. Thank you so much. I thought I actually had a question myself. So if it's OK, I'll maybe begin with mine. And then I think Frederick is the second one, and then Pedro. So okay, um, sure. Uh, you, Dr. Valiante, you, you brought up uh, Wilder Penfield a few times, and I'm, I'm sort of curious because uh, in his book, uh, The Mystery of the Mind, he sort of talks about the idea that the brain itself doesn't explain the mind fully. And I'm curious to know your take. Do you, do you think the mind is uh, an irreducible, non-physical entity? How, how do you sort of relate to this? I, I'm sorry if it's a little bit philosophically oriented, oh. but I'm curious to know your thoughts. No, I mean, it's a fascinating thing, you know, you know, in, in my era, when I grew up as a PhD student, it was very taboo to actually talk about consciousness, for example, it was just something that you just didn't do it was to kind of, and in fact, now I collaborate with somebody who's doing this antagonistic uh, trial between two competing theories on consciousness. So I actually, I, I do very well know that sort of Wilder Penfield discourse on this and it really stemmed from the fact that when he would do the stimulation mapping in the operating room when something would when a person's hand would move or their finger would move they could clearly see that they weren't willing it to move and so for him this was really this clear cut evidence um, that the that the mind itself is distinct from the the, the physical structure of the brain uh, i don't believe that uh, i believe that the mind is emergent property of the most complex device on in the universe. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, math, not to describe the brain itself, but the idea around sort of self-organizing systems. And so consciousness, you name it, all of that arises from the physical structure and the emergent properties of a highly complex system. Wonderful, thank you. All right, I think, uh, Frederick, you're next. Uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, Dr. Valiente. Thank you so much for your talk and really fascinating stuff. Um, I have a specific question about the uh, neuromodulation work you've done in your lab. Uh, you mentioned sort of the, the BCI working on unit, I think, as well as a sort of single neuron learning task, eventually, I guess, for a closed loop stimulator for epilepsy. Uh, I was wondering how you're, you're implementing, you know, sort of feature extraction analysis, keeping in mind, you know, stuffing horsepower into a low power, low heat dissipation, low compute, uh, you know, requirements for an eventual battery power device. I know you mentioned, you know, convolving using Gaussian kernel, which might require sort of like big matrix multiplication. So is this eventual low power requirement part of your design from the ground up, or is that sort of farther in the future? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. So that BCI work, uh, you know, to do single unit recordings in an implantable device is not yet feasible because you need sampling rates of, you know, on the order of like 30 kilohertz to actually properly sample a one millisecond action potential. So right now we have no current interest in single unit um, uh, either detection or sorting um, on device. What we do have are devices that work on local field potentials. 
Um, and there the same problems arise. It's like, what can you pack into a system? And that is, that is actually fundamentally part of design. In fact, may, the main thing we're trying to do is we're trying to now, the, the, a lot of the energy is actually um, uh, consumed by the classification step. Um, and so Gerard has come up with a very ingenious approach to using a random forest classifier. Um, and uh, what, 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 what uh, is kind of in a way you could kind of argue is around a little bit similar to neuromorphic computing where your compute cycles don't occur, are not occurring constantly because of the clock, the uh, clock running on, on a chip, uh, but basically because there's a specific events that trigger a compute and classification cycle. Um, and so these are you know, great ways of reducing power. And you know, we just met recently, which is reduce the power consumption of, of his first version of the chip by about tenfold. Um, and for sure, uh, for a surety that these chips are being designed to be implanted. Now, we recognize the fact that some of the feature type of stuff, some of the learning, for example, particularly the training component of it cannot be done on chip. Um, and so in fact, then what we do is we, our device, it has a, a ton of memory on it. So it's gonna store a lot of continuous data. When you stand beside a little edge server or something like that, it's gonna dump the data to that thing. Locally or in a cloud, it's gonna do that, gonna update its training models and then send those models over to the device. So, we see this kind of learning with the patient. These things will happen chronically over time. Uh, that device, Animo, is prototyped now. And we're actually doing some monkey experiments in Kingston. Uh, not an implanted device, but a device on the outside. So, I mean, it's a great question. And yes, we pivoted probably about two years ago when a lot of the work we're doing was on chip design, where we realized that if you're, if you're going to get into the world of machine learning, and we try to do acute studies in, in the epilepsy monitoring unit, we will never get there because the thing about machine learning is that it's just data greedy. Um, and so you have to have implanted devices, you have to have long-term uh, you know, data from, from, from individuals to really start to create you know, better models uh, of classification. So the, the, the two-pronged um, approach here is to have a really great chip does the classification really well, can be trained well, but also can store a lot of data for doing that, that training offline. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think, Pedram, you're next. Please go ahead. For sure. Well, first of all, Dr. Valente, that was a brilliant talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I personally learned and enjoyed the presentation very, very much. Um, what I have a question about, and I apologize if it's such a general question, but um, the field of quantum computing is just so exciting. And I'm wondering um, what kind of, um, or how do you think it'll shape uh, the field of epilepsy and the research in epilepsy? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's an interesting question because um, right now at the University of, of Toronto, Fujitsu has um, a research center and they have, is, is not, it's not a quantum, computer, it's, it's, a, it's a quantum annealer, uh, and it anneals at room temperature. Um, and what, what quantum computers do is, or at least their main application, is an optimization. So they solve optimization problems. And the reason why they solve optimization problems is because the physical principle of annealing is that in a complex connected network of interacting things that if you slowly lower the temperature, they're gonna fall into some low energy state and that and low energy state actually gives you the solution to your optimization problem. And so it's very good at solving these optimizations. So very good for solving like, you know, a problem where you have to maximize the dose to a tumor, minimize the dose to uh, the, the tissue around it, for example. It's uh, classically used for the traveling salesman problem. So it's got great application there. The thing about the brain though, is that the, the question you're trying to ask is almost the inverse of it. It's actually, in, the, the problem you're trying to solve in neuroscience is what's called the inverse Ising problem. Uh, because a quantum computer is based on Is the Ising model, basically. And the inverse Ising problem is this, is that if you have a set of states, which you know in your particles, or you can call them neurons, how can you infer the connectivity between these? Or what are the weights connecting them? 
And that's what we're interested in neuroscience. We're interested in the weights. So in fact, we proposed this problem to Fujitsu. They were initially actually quite interested, um, but they told us that it's gonna take a massive revamp of their hardware to do the inverse Ising uh, problem. Having said that, any neuroscience problem that can be formulated as an optimization problem, uh, quantum computers will be helpful for that. Right now though, they haven't found a place, although fascinatingly, the, the lattices, which are sort of, one can think of like a lattice, which is what, you know, these, uh, the qubits exist in, in fact, has, has been made sort of uh, uh, thought to be analogous to neurons and their interactions. And so these Ising models have, have a long history in neurosciences. They're like the statistical mechanical model of the brain, just like, um, what is that law that, um, that, that relates a number of molecules to the pressure in a closed system? I forgot that name, but, but basically you're not gonna compute the trajectory of each molecule in a gas. You have laws that govern the collective, the collective features of that gas. And so that's what, you know, this is really around statistical physics. So it may not be super promising, but you, you never say never, right? So I, I think it's, it's gonna be very, very interesting. And you know, I think a lot of things can be formulated as optimization problems. I, there's actually companies that don't build quantum computers, but basically you go to them, you present them the optimization problem that you wanna solve, and they actually then end up writing the code for the computer because it's just such a apparently difficult problem. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah that was great. Great. Um, was it the ideal gas that you were mentioning, Dr. Valiante? Or? Which, what's that? Sorry. Was it the ideal gas law you were mentioning? Yeah, 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 okay, okay. yeah, yeah. Bo Great. Is it Boyle's law or something? I don't know what it is. Who knows? I think PV is the Boyle one. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. I got that wrong in high school, so I remember it. <laughs> okay. um, next question, I think, uh, sorry, uh, is Steve, then Philip, then Pedram, I think. So, Steve. Yeah, it's been a while since I heard Boyle's and Gay Hacks and ideal gas law. So this is a, <laughs> definitely interesting. Uh, hey, Dr. Valiante, thanks for nice, the great presentation. And honestly, yeah, it's nice to put a face to the name, but also yeah, same, as same. somebody that loves the basic sciences, it's nice to see the amount of impact you can make using a basic sciences approach. Yeah. And so uh, I have kind of a two-part question. The first sure. question is like, given your own background in uh, quantitative disciplines, how much of your success would you attribute to your like technical background? So like math and coding. Uh, so first of all, success is a very strong word. I, I don't know what that means exactly. Um, I'll say that I derive the most fun uh, as sort of along my trajectory around coding, particularly around signal processing. So that's kind of my, my fascination. And just like Berger, you know, who described the alpha oscillations, who thought that they were the, you know, the underlied, you know, extrasensory perception uh, to this day in my old age now, I think there's something still magic in those oscillations and those waves yet to be extracted with, you know, advanced computational tools. So in fact, as I sort of articulated at the beginning, my, my definition of computation has really driven my entire scientific career. It is this kind of desperate desire to use the mathematical and physical physics tools to describe the physical world, I just happened to choose um, the, the brain. Um, the thing about my science, my research endeavors are, is that they're multi-scale and they also have a translational component. And I think that when you start to, when you start to move into the realm of application, like devices and stuff, you start to get to a point where mechanism just might not be the way of ultimately building a device because you're so impeded by your lack of understanding of what's happening. Um, and so, you know, for example, I'll give you a simple example, which is, you know, a major field of engineering is control theory. And for control theory, basically, it basically underlies how you create an autopilot system, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason you can do that is because we have, we, the, the laws of nature, the physical laws of nature are known and they can be computed. And if you know the angle of a, a wing and the, the speed of the air, you can predict what's gonna happen you know, in the next millisecond and two milliseconds. We don't have a model of the brain. Control becomes almost impossible in, in the system like a brain. And so you go to basically 
you know, what I think will ultimately be what's going to help us is kind of reinforcement learning approaches where you just brute force it, where you record lots of data, you stimulate with a palette of stimuli, you see what the brain does, and then you sort of create this kind of hybrid palette that you real you, you learn that if you add this stimulation to that stimulation, it'll give you this brain state. And I think that's because right now we just don't have access to the kind of things we need to observe with the brain. And in control theory is basically predicated on observability, which means you can't control a system if you can't observe it properly. Uh, you know, and then even if you can observe it, then is it controllable? I mean, that's another you know, thing. So yes, I think you know, the math and the physics has really, is really fundamental to the way I see the endeavors you know, in my lab. And it's not so much that I have this monolithic view, it's just that what is what I'm comfortable with is how I see the world. So we tend to gravitate to the things that you know, we're most comfortable with. And so, um, you know, like for example, when somebody talks to me about short-term memory, I know how it's defined. I know like a lot of literature on oscillations and how they're modulated by short-term memory, but I don't have a strong understanding of what that means in the brain. I, I can't think of what that means. Whereas if somebody said to me, well, you know, we patched a neuron and it demonstrate this frequency profile, I probably could list off like a hundred reasons why I think that frequency profile is there. And I'd have a lot of reasons, you know, I thought of ideas of how to test it and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, I don't have that kind of model for me. So I'm very granular in the way, you know, I see, I see the brain and I see brain problems. I've had to give that up because I want to develop devices that have therapeutic benefit and you have to drop that at some point. And that's why I think my collaboration with engineers has been particularly valuable because they don't necessarily care about the mechanism. They're like, well, if it works, it works, you know, so. Oh, uh, thank you. I think there's a lot of context to be gained by having that basic sciences background, or at least that yeah. computational background. And so like the second part of the question is for people that don't have as strong of like a math science or a CS background, what's your advice to like aspiring clinician scientists? Well, you know, I see the world in one way, uh, you know, mine is a very narrow perspective because I come from this background. So my first piece of advice to anybody is kind of, it's almost like what the, one of my first slides was, was find your why, you know, and that why then guides your how and your what. Um, for some strange reason, I wanted to understand the brain when I was a teenager. And again, for some strange reason, reason I thought that the brain could be described by physics and math. Um, and so I was very lucky. I always joke with people that I never had a choice in what I did because it got built into me so early and I don't know where it came from exactly. Um, but that why has been sort of um, fundamental for me because, you know, and I've, I had this, I don't know if any of you tuned in, but I had this discussion on this thing called growing up in academia. There's an interview with Lucha Maloney, who's a scientist at one of the Max Planck Institutes. And my path has not been simple. You know, this is not like a, it's not a surefire thing. It doesn't, it's not a linear path that I've had. I've struggled with every decision that I've made. I even struggled when I came back to Toronto thinking maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I should have started a wet lab and maybe I should be, you know, studying rodents and stuff like that. So that why is central. That will guide your how and your what. Um, you know, if you want to use your computational tools for bioinformatics and, you know, do other stuff, there's that whole exploring, exploding field there as well, or, you know, cancer or, or whatever it might be. But I would say that, and, I, and I, I'm quoting from a very cool nature opinion piece, which is, it's kind of a list of top 10 things uh, that uh, graduate st students need to do. And the number one is stop using Excel. Number two is stop using Excel. And number three is stop using Excel. So it's like coding now has become the language of the world. If you're doing a degree in the humanities, you're probably writing Python code to sort of do some kind of language parsing of some piece of Shakespeare or whatever. So it's everywhere. Um, and I think that if you want to run fast, you, you have to have those tools. For example, you know, the Allen Institute is putting out pentabytes of data. They're doing experiments, which I will never do and my lab will never do. But we have questions that are kind of similar to the kind of things they're asking. We can use their data along with our data to sort of make claims of things. And if you don't have the tools to extract that information, you can't use the, the emerging amount of data that's in the world, open science. So I really feel strongly that those 
computational tools in whatever field, molecular biology now. Look at, look at analyzing single cell RNA sequencing data. I mean, it's all bio, it's hardcore bioinformatics. You know, you will not see a, 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 a genetic paper without a UMAP and some dimensionality reduction stuff and, you know, some crazy graph thing going on. And it, it, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's inescapable. Um, you know. wow. Yeah, the world's becoming data science problem. Thanks for the insight. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right. I think the next question is uh, from Philip. But um, if anyone has a question, yeah, just you can use the hand raise feature. Or if you'd like, you can either um, you can even uh, type as well. And we'd be happy to read it out. But uh, Philip, go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Valiante, for your, uh, for your, for your talk. I found it really interesting. Um, and I'm also mindful of the time, so I'll keep my question short. It's a little bit uh, also on a vague side or more general. Um, but when we're talking about neuromodulation, uh, you know, one thing that always comes to mind is like way down in the future, the possibility of not just curing diseases, but enhancing a normal sort of uh, sort of circuits, so to say. And, and how does ethics play into this? And when you're thinking down the road of, you know, the ethical side of things, um, you know, is, is that something that uh, you're looking into or something that's still you know, more down the road when there's maybe something more tangible? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. We actually have a, um, a neuroethics part of Crania and, uh, and because we have a strong neuromodulation group at the Toronto Western Hospital, in fact, you know, the Toronto Western really been the pioneers in neuromodulation. I, I have a bit of a cynical comment on it, and it's just to highlight something which is a pet peeve of mine. Um, I do think, though, at the end of the day, you know, will we be able to develop devices that can translate the quality of experience? Qualia? I, I don't think so. Uh, but, you know, you, you never say never. But I'll tell you what my pet peeve is. And my pet peeve is, is that, you know, the kind of control that we can exert with neuromodulated devices is very blunt, right? And, and people talk about regulating that. And then if you just look at the device that you have in your hand that most people have probably been playing with, it has greater power to modulate your behavior in a very, very, refined way to nudge your, your decisions, to, to nudge you into voting a certain way, et cetera, et cetera. And none of that is regulated. So there's extensive systems of control, you know, that exist in our society, which remain largely unregulated. So I remember reading this position piece in nature. It actually had somebody from BC. She's a, a neuroethicist. She's kind of like a preeminent neuro, neuro, Judy Isles. And Raphael Justi, who's uh, this kind of um, stellar physiology uh, person, they wrote this thing. And I happened to meet Judy, and I didn't know who she was at that time. So I went on this rant, you know, around this. And I feel very strongly about that. I feel that right now our devices are so coarse, so whatever, that the idea of you know implanting memories or extracting memories, blah blah blah, on and on and on, is so far down the line. And we should really be focusing on the people who are really manipulating the masses. And in fact, the population of people we're going to implant devices in is so tiny and fractional that, you know, right now, it's really hard to argue that that's a huge societal concern. Now, on the other hand, there are humanists or whatever that, I don't know, there's all these, these groups of people who think that, you know, the next kind of like, it's kind of almost a religious thing, these transhumanists and stuff like that, where you know, that we're going to have devices to upload consciousness and stuff like that and, and everything like that. And it's like, I don't even know where to start to having that discussion. I think that I, I can barely describe what a neuron does, let alone, you know, implanting, you know, a fake memory or extracting out, you know, a person's what they did on a summer holiday. I, I don't, I don't know. But sorry, but that, that's my cynical thing. Uh, I, think um, I think that's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and I guess, and I guess, yeah, and so just to answer, not to minimize your question, so yes, I think people are thinking about that. You have people like Elon Musk, for example, who has, you know, this kind of, um, uh, I think, you know, an interesting perspective about the idea of, you know, being able to plug into an AI system and to be able to control it in some way. 
uh, to not to be the slaves of AI, but to be sort of the masters of it through these neural interfaces, uh, to increase that the bus width or the information flow between the brain because communication, verbal communication is very slow and clunky. Um, and then people like, you know, Brian Johnson of Kernel uh, who are similarly interested in maybe in a different in a different vein. And then you have all these kinds of devices like Muse and this, that, and the other, all these devices, you know, transcranial, transdermal stimulation, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there's maybe some things in it. Uh, you know, I, I don't kind of put down these kinds of types of neuromodulation. For example, we have a very active interest in music um, and its effect on people with epilepsy. And we have a very strong hypothesis that's based on the statistical nature of musical pieces, which we think alters uh, brain activity in specific ways. And now we're working with people at the Max Planck to do these massive online experiments to sort of, you know, actually test out these types of hypotheses. And at the end of the day, you know, right now you're neuromodulating. And when I listen to my favorite piece of music, I'm neuromodulating. And when I'm being mindful, I'm neuromodulating. So it's like everything's neuromodulation, whether it's implanted or not. Okay, wonderful. So we are actually hitting at 930. Um, okay. So I, I apologize. I, I think we have one more question. But uh, how do you feel, Dr. Valiente? Would you like to entertain sure. it? Or would you... Absolutely. Yeah, we'll just sure. go with one last one before we close yeah, it. Sure. Aisha, Absolutely. please. Hi, so um, my question is just related to the previous question that was asked and just um, sort of extrapolating, like going the other way around on the idea of like implanting memories. And, and so I just wanted to know what is um, your view on like when psychiatrists or psychologists, they do therapy or they talk to a patient and they modify memory and how a person experiences memory. Does that on a like a physical level alter the biochemistry or the structure of an individual neuron? Just like a I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, you know, if you if you argue that the brain, the mind is an emergent property of a physical system, then you know we have lots of data to demonstrate that you know things like short-term plasticity, long-term uh, plasticity are structural changes that occur in synaptic spines and synaptic weights. Um, and I mean, that's the inherent hallmark of learning, which is there has to be some physical, stru physical structural change to your brain, uh, because how else would you encode uh, uh, information? And, you know, I think that, you know, one other big the thing that I'm really, um, you know, I'm very passionate about is, um, you know, trying to find alternative ways of improving people's quality of life in epilepsy. And that's how we got onto the music uh, stuff. You know, I was very nihilistic uh, about that. And, you know, we, we, you know we, we had a control piece, which was actually a scrambled version. So it had the same power spectrum as the, as a test piece, uh, but it had no phase information or scrambled phase information. Um, and we demonstrated, you know, a very strong effect. Now you could say that's placebo, or you could say that the person was being more mindful because every night they listened to that piece of music and they developed a habit and that habit helped them to go to sleep on time. And that sleep helped them then not to have a seizure. So you could postulate all sorts of, you know, sort of things, but inherently the brain is a learning system. And, you know, there's fascinating stuff. For example, if, if you, you know, in Parkinson's patients, you know, if you show them their medications, if they're anticipating their medication, their, their tremor goes away. Like it's remarkable. The brain kind of, has an understanding, probably a reinforcement learning perspective. It knows and it can stabilize specific healthy, that's my, my hypothesis. The brain can, through reinforcement learning, stabilize healthy brain states. And that's not super novel because look at Stoic philosophy, you know, look at, look at mindfulness. You know, this is all about the fact that your brain is intrinsically plastic. I mean, how you perceive the world is your choice. Right? This is inherent in so many philosophies. And it's true. You know, and I'll tell you, I mean, you know, I speak openly about this. You know, I went through a very terrible depression. And you know, it, I, I didn't emerge from it because of the medications that I, I had to take. I emerged from it because I had to retool how I saw the world and how I valued the things that I do, you know, and, and how I you know, interacted with the world around me. So, and these are plastic changes. And so 
I am very much for non-surgical intervention. I'm very much for the mindfulness stuff and the, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm strongly believe in that. Um, I think that, you know, all the things that we do and, and that's why, you know, I'm very strongly pro a proponent in clinic too, is like, you know, for my patients after they've done surgery, it's like, are you volunteering? You know, how's your family? What are you doing? How are you keeping active? You know, like, these are my responsibilities then, you know, to, to sort of understand how are people actually engaging their mind in, in healthy ways? And, you know, and I, and I don't think any device right now can take us to that. You know, there's no, no, no device necessarily. I mean, I have a friend and he's a, he's a colleague of mine who's a, a you know, a really an expert in, in depression and he himself went through a depressive episode and he's emerging from it and he emerged from it because he had to retool his life just like, you know, I had to do. And it's funny because I talked to him, he's like, you know, it's crazy because all that shit that I was actually prescribing to my patients, it's, it's garbage because it's not what helped me get better, you know? So, you know, and, and I think that that's where like, you know, these tools which we're developing are very, very coarse tools. They're just, they're bludgeoning, you know, a very incredibly, you know, beautiful thing, which is the brain. Um, you know, I think that the finesse, you know, in life is actually how the brain learns to control itself. And I think that that's kind of like that paper where we show the brain can actually learn to control an individual neuron, you know, and maybe a device that can, and that's why I think your feedback and stuff like that's a fascinating idea is that with machine learning now, if we have lots of data sets where we can actually kind of start to understand that in a person's day as they're walking around doing their thing, whatever, what is a healthy brain state versus a non-healthy brain state? Even that feedback alone, I think in fact could be a very powerful way of helping people, you know? And if you, you know, pair it with an external stimulus, which has some reinforcement, a musical piece that they like, or, you know, like a, a favorite memory that they, you know, that they're reminded of. Maybe you can pair this through instrumental learning and reinforcement learning to actually change behavior. And I think that that's why we see, in fact, you know, and, and you know, your question too speaks to something which is super important in society too, which is that, you know, this idea of free will, I and mean, this was kind of raised too about, you know, emergent properties of the mind is like, our, our mind's property don't emerge, you know, from a brain that sits in a vacuum. It emerges from its interactions with the environment. You know, that's why I'm, I love this whole idea of embodied cognition, which is that if you're actually going to describe, you know, how the brain works, you have to take its environmental uh, environment into, into play, into, into account. And in fact, it comes very difficult because if you're going to write out those differential equations, the differential equations have to be an open system where the brain is interacting with an environment. And that becomes super complicated. So it's much easier to study the brain as a, as a box sitting in the head and it's showing these pictures and then it responds to the pictures. But in fact, it's constantly sending out signals into the environment, interacting, modulating the environment and then getting those signals back. You know, and I think that as much as I love newer technology and you know, I love all that stuff and I love the academic components of it, I think they're just very, very fundamental ways of society retooling itself towards you know, healthier states. And I, and I don't think it's that super fancy um, as, you know, some closed loop device. Uh. Wonderful. I mean, we went to embodied cognition of Carl Friston and now classical music. We're tempted to invite you to talk about philosophy and music in the future for Gaussian. Sure. sure. So if you'll take sure. us up an offer for a second talk, because it's just yeah. so diverse, the things you say, incredible, really. Uh, yeah, just to I mean, add, yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, I love to talk about the music because the music stuff is fascinating because almost like any other field in neuromodulation, there is a computational underpinning that actually tweaked the person doing it to the idea that electrical stimulation could stop seizures. So it would be a fascinating discussion to have around music for sure. Okay, so I guess we already have you booked for next year. <laughs> there is that. Uh, speaking of your talk again, thank you very much to all of you who came. Of course, Dr. Valiante for giving us this time is incredibly busy. Something we missed, but we just want to share. This is the kickstart of a new series, Innovation, Creativity, and Neurotechnology. We started at CampSign. And uh, again, the ideas on bold revolutionary thinking, interdisciplinary thoughts, and all of that, which we saw a great snippet of tonight. And again, we hope to have more of these kinds of series in, in, in tangent with other things we do at campsite.
Uh, I'm going to pass it on to introduce our last event for this year as well. So that uh, is coming up too. Absolutely, yeah. So we actually have um, two other events coming up um, and potentially maybe a third one, but the next one coming up this month is uh, the UBC case of the month with Dr. Ailing and Dr. Rizzuto. Uh, we haven't, uh, we don't know the date yet, but we'll be sure to uh, update you. And uh, as for the next uh, keynote um, speaker, we have Dr. Gellar Zade in our woman neurosurgery series. And uh, we're really Better excited be paying to paying attention when she talks. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> So we're really, really excited for that. And um, we'll give you further details once we have the poster and uh, the event all ready to go. But uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Valentin, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you to our audience for joining us and sticking around and uh, asking all sorts of lovely and wonderful questions. And uh, we, we are going to stop the recording now. Um, so that uh, and it'll be posted uh, so feel free to watch it again if you'd like but uh yeah thank you all so much and uh, hope everyone has a great rest of their evening thank you take care guys yeah.